Well, greetings everyone and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and around the world in more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. For more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordonlaw.org. Again, that's georgegordonlaw.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. All right, we're talking about the Ten Commandments in American Law. It's a surprise that more than 15,000 documents, treatises, constitutions, statutes, judgments, Supreme Court decisions, quotations from books, and periodicals, and citations from presidents are all contained in this little book, 326 pages. It doesn't have all 15,000, but it identifies the fact that of the 56 signers to our Declaration of Independence, all of them, all of them, of our 44 presidents, all of them, have made statements, comments, etc. Our Supreme Courts, in every session, our laws reflect these Ten Commandments in American law. And it's not just here either. You'll find it in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and all of Western Europe. Furthermore, you'll find it in all of the British Commonwealth countries, such as India and Pakistan. Wherever the British have gone, their law has followed. And we call it Anglo-Saxon administration. Now, in our country today, the use of the Bible, prayer, or the mention of God in public is almost strictly prohibited. I mean, you'd do better using the F word in public than you would to bring up the Bible, at least here in the United States. But it hasn't always been that way. It, it isn't that we were always this ir irreverent or we, we were always this ignorant, but we certainly are today. Now we're up to the seventh commandment. We've covered the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth commandments. Now let's take a look at the seventh commandment, which, uh, commandment here, which deals with adultery. It deals with those laws that reflect upon the family. Now, in Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English Language, he gives the following definition. Adultery is a violation of the marriage bed. It's a crime or, or a civil injury which introduces or may introduce into a family a spurious offspring. And by the laws of Connecticut, the sexual intercourse of any man with a married woman is the crime of adultery in both. Such intercourse of a married man with an unmarried woman is fornication in both and adultery of the man. Within the meaning of the law respecting divorce, but not a felonious adultery in either, or the crime of adultery at common law or by statute. Now this latter offense is, in England, proceeded with only in the ecclesiastical courts. In common usage, adultery means the unfaithfulness of any married person to the marriage bed. In England, Parliament grant absolute divorces for infidelity to the marriage bed in either party, and the spiritual courts divorce a manza et thoro. All right, now that's the Seventh Commandment definition according to Webster. Now, Matthew D. Staver puts it this way. He says, A Seventh Commandment states, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And a 1641 Massachusetts law declared that if any person committeth adultery with a married or espoused wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. You can see in the early days of our colonies, we prescribed not only the law, but also the penalty, and it followed the same penalty as the scripture, time after time. So our early forefathers actually practiced the scripture. Well, not... Not 100%, but, you know, they were doing a lot better job than we are today. And as a result of that, the early practitioners of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, produced here in America, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand something phenomenal. The richest, most powerful nations in the world, both for themselves and for their race. 
and as a group, as a as a nation of people, or a race of people, it has never been excelled. the The empire of the Anglo Saxons and its dominance for the last 300 years over planet Earth has been uh, has been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And the the primary reason for that is the practice of this law. The thing that makes a nation great is its morality. And that's because the morality brings upon the blessings of God, and the blessings of God are the power, the wealth, prosperity, and the morality of those people. Now take a look at the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Couple that with Western Europe, and then take a look at the G7 nations. Take a look at the wealth of the world and who's got most of it. Take a look at the power structure of the world and who's in possession of it. Take a look at political dominance in the world and who's got possession of that. Now, if you'll take a look around the world, you'll see that Anglo-Saxon administration is slipping everywhere. It's been slipping for the last 50 or 60 years. The great British Empire has been dismantled. And the great American Empire is in the process of being dismantled. Something's happening now. Something's going on here. Now, back in the colonial eras, similar laws were enacted by Connecticut in 1642, Rhode Island in 1647, New Hampshire in 1680, and Pennsylvania in 1705. So in the early colonies, adultery was treated as a death sentence. It was a capital felony. Now, the Texas Criminal Appeals Court has said this. The accused would insist upon the defense that the female consented. The state would reply that she could not consent. And why? Well, because the law prohibits with a penalty the completed act. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That is our law as well as the law of the Bible. Now, the Texas Court of Appeals hit the nail on the head, and that's the requirement that we practice strict liability. It may be true that the female consented to the act of adultery and was part and parcel with it. What that means is you didn't rape her, but between the two of you, you consented to practice a capital felony. Rape is a capital felony. Adultery is a capital felony. And it's designed to protect the family and the sanctity of the family. The family is the building block of society. And when you want to destroy society, you destroy the building blocks. America's building blocks of family has, past tense, been destroyed. And the nation will surely follow. That's the bottom line. That's the history of the world. That's the way it's always been in the past, and that's the way it is now, and that's the way it's going to be in the future. The American experiment is dead, D-E-D, -E dead on arrival. Now, it's sad. We had a great opportunity, we Americans, and then we threw it away. Now, that's been the history of mankind from the beginning. God has bestowed upon us certain benefits and blessings, certain opportunities. And like as not, as time progresses, we muff it. As my old dad used to say, well, you muffed it. You blew it. Now, going on here, the Supreme Court of Washington had something to say about this. The Washington Supreme Court said adultery, whether promiscuous or not, violates one of the Ten Commandments and the statutes of this state. Now, notice both of these Supreme Courts here have referred to the Ten Commandments as being the basis of this law. The influence of the Seventh Commandment by William J. Federer, he said, the influence of the Seventh Commandment is shown in colonial documents, state documents, court decisions, historians, and presidents. Now, in the colonial documents, the Code of Connecticut, the General Court of 1650, in the Capital Laws section of the Code stated, quote, If any man or woman shall lie with any beast or brute creature by carnal copulation, they shall surely be put to death, and the beast shall be slain and buried. 
that is cited from Leviticus 20, verses 15 and 16. And if any man lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, and they shall surely be put to death. That's Leviticus 20, verse 13. And that's called sodomy. And the colonial legislature of New York's colony in 1665 enacted, it is ordered that a church shall be built in each parish capable of holding 200 persons, that ministers of every church shall preach every Sunday and pray for the king, the queen, and the Duke of York and the royal family, and to marry persons after legal publication of license. Church wardens to report twice a year all misdemeanors such as swearing, profaneness, Sabbath-breaking, drunkenness, fornication, adultery, and all such abominable sins. Came out of the New York colony in 1665. Notice that they followed the statutes in the scripture precisely. Now, in state documents, the Constitution of the State of New York, adopted in 1777, said in Article 38 that the free exercise, enjoyment, and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever hereafter be allowed within this state to all mankind, provided that the liberty of conscience hereby granted shall not be so construed as to excuse acts of licentiousness or adultery. The Constitution of the State of Arizona, adopted on the 12th of December 1911, said that, it's number two, the second article, polygamy, polygamous or plural marriages, or polygamous cohabitation are forever prohibited within this state. And the Constitution of the State of Texas, adopted on August 27, 1845, said in Article 7, Section 18, No divorce shall be granted by the legislature. And the Constitution of the State of Alabama, adopted in 1901, said in Article 8, Section 182, Disqualification of Voters. The following persons shall be disqualified both from registering and from voting, namely, all idiots and insane person, those who shall by reason of conviction of crime be disqualified from voting at the time of the ratification of this Constitution, those who shall be convicted of treason, murder, arson, embezzlement, malfeasance in office, larceny, receiving stolen property, obtaining property or money under false pretenses, perjury, subordination of perjury, robbery, assault with intent to rob, burglary, forgery, bribery, assault and battery on the wife, bigamy, living in adultery, sodomy, or incest. Notice here at the very end of the statute, here it's in your constitution, you Alabamans. Back here in 1901, you identified assault and battery on the wife, bigamy, living in adultery, sodomy, and incest. For which... Persons of that character were incompetent to vote. Now, I would submit to you today, if you were to take a look at that list of crimes, I think that would encompass all the voters of Alabama, wouldn't it? I mean, if you applied that statute strictly to the people of Alabama today, you might have 35 or 40 people that could go to the polls and vote. Boy, that's a, that's a statement now, isn't it? And get this, the whole nation's that way. It isn't just you people in Alabama. Hell, it's the whole damn country. Now, when Sodom and Gomorrah got to the point of licentiousness, that God himself said, I'm going over and take a look. I've had a bad report. Let me go take a look at this eyeball to eyeball and see if this report is true. That's what he told Abraham. And when he got there, he found that there were not ten, as Abraham had prescribed, Remember, Abraham started off with 50. If there be 50 righteous in the city, would you destroy this city for the sake of 50? And God said, no. He brought it down to 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 10, 10. You got 10? Sounded like an auctioneer. You got 10? Hell no, he couldn't find 10 righteous in the entire city. So he destroyed the city and saved the four righteous guys out of it of which, as it turned out, uh, one of the four righteous didn't degrade. 
Now that's the bottom line to that. This entire nation lives like Sodom and Gomorrah, and we, we revel in it. I was watching Leno the other day, and he had this neat little joke about, uh, about bestiality. Bestiality wasn't a joke in this country, and it was dead serious. Today we make sport of it. We make light of it. Now, in our state documents as a nation, the Constitution of the State of New York adopted in 1777, Arizona, now Pennsylvania, same thing. The, the, these various states have adopted, in fact, all the states adopted at one time or another laws against adultery. And then little by little, we've repealed them. Now, take a look at where we're at today with this gay marriage thing. You know, that's going to lead us to a no-good end. I don't know where the end is. I have to concede I'm not a prophet, and I can't tell you that, but it's going to come to a no-good end. Historically, nations, city-states, and empires that go into licentiousness, they go into national captivity. They just cease to exist. And it's usually by way of a bloody end. A bloody end. So sit back now and get ready for it. Now, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 1824, in the case of Updegraft versus the Commonwealth, and then they recorded the court's declaration that the act against cursing and swearing and breach of the Lord's Day, the act forbidding incestuous marriages, perjury by taking a false oath upon the book, fornication and adultery, for all of these are founded on Christianity. For all these are restraints upon civil liberty. You know, it's certainly true that these are restraints upon your liberties. You know, I, I would like to go out and commit adultery. I think it's a great, great sport. And there's some people out there I don't like, and I'd like to go out and kill them. And there's a lot of neat stuff out there that I'd like to just go out and take. But theft, murder, and adultery have been outlawed by the creator of the universe and everybody has a duty you don't have to be a catholic you don't have to be a protestant a mormon a jew or, or a baptist or a, or a muslim or somebody else everybody on planet earth is encompassed by this natural law it's called natural law in most places that's because we don't we feel self-conscious about calling this the law of god the law of the creator and that's because we don't like to acknowledge that there is such a creature, that there is somebody out there that has the, has the say-so or the rule over us. So we like to use these benign terms like, well, the, the, the great guy in the sky, or, or uh, you know, him, or he, or, or uh, the, the great light. We use some kind of a euphemism to describe God the Creator, Allah, he's called by the Muslims. Jehovah by the Jehovah's Witnesses. But, you know, we, we've all got the same duty. Every man-drawn breath has that same duty. And these duties were incorporated into our secular laws. And then little by little, evil and wicked men, little by little, these evil and wicked men have, have infiltrated our legislatures and taken over in our bureaucracies and taken over in our in our presidencies and governorships. And then by sleight of hand and by subtle suggestions said, you know, we ought to liberalize this law. It wouldn't be kind and gentle to go out and stone this guy to death, now would it? And so now we're down to gay marriage. Now we're down to the point where we've got men marrying men and women marrying women. And you think that there is no comeuppance for that? That there's that there's no God in heaven that's going to call us to account for that? Honest to God, do you believe that this nation can get away with that? You know, maybe you do. Well, nobody's ever gotten away with it in the past. And it's not likely that we're going to get away with it now. Not likely. Now, the United States Supreme Court back in 1885 in a case called Murphy v. Ramsey and others, he said every person who has a husband or wife living and marries another is guilty of polygamy and shall be punished. 
And certainly no legislation can be supposed more wholesome and necessary in the founding of a free, self-governing commonwealth than that which seeks to establish it on the basis of the idea of the family as consisting in and springing from the union for life of one man and one woman in the holy state of matrimony. Marriage is the sure foundation of all that is stable and noble in our civilization. The best guarantee of that reverent morality, which is the source of all beneficent progress in social and political improvement. What was that, the Supreme Court? Yep, United States Supreme Court. Now, notice they're opposed to polygamy. Now, polygamy isn't unscriptural. There's 24 cases of polygamy in the Bible, and the Christians went a little overboard there, and in many cases they did. You know, the thing of, 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 of burning witches at the stake, that's, that goes beyond the scope of the Scripture. It's against the law to burn witches at the stake. Christians got a little overzealous. But the point that we're trying to make here is that, uh, hey, listen, they weren't opposed to bringing the Bible into play. Even if they used the Bible incorrectly, they, they sure as hell weren't opposed to bringing the Bible into play and putting it in its principles into our laws, even if they went overboard and put principles of law that they thought they got out of the Bible into our secular law. They weren't evolutionists. They weren't anti-God. And they were not anti-Ten Commandments. But we surely are today. We are evolutionists. We are anti-God. We are anti-Bible. And I'm just suggesting I think that's probably a bad policy to follow. Bad policy. Some of us ought to be thinking about that and saying, Are you really sure that that's what you want to do? Now, last time I pointed out to you, that God in Deuteronomy 7 had something to say about that, so let me just uh, point that out to you. Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 9, he says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays them that hate him to their face to destroy them. And he will not be slack to him that hates him. And he will repay him to his face. You shall therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command you this day to do them. Now that's a pretty powerful statement there, boys and girls. And there's a lot of people out there that have been giving this God the finger. And I sit back on my my hunches and I say, hey, I think that's going to come to a no good end. Our founding fathers were very careful when they're in their writings to point out that you ought not to be giving this God the finger. Today, giving God the finger is a form of sport in the United States. It's as common as pig tracks in a barnyard. Now, as a reporter, I'm not here to tell you that you ought to practice the Ten Commandments. That's not my role in life. I wouldn't tell you not to. I wouldn't tell you that you should. But as a reporter, we should look at the history of bygone civilizations and city-states and empires. You know, looking at the Roman Empire and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, throughout history, civilizations come, civilizations go. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. And it would behoove all of us to pay attention to what those causes of those declines are. And moral turpitude is one of the causes for the decline and fall of nation states and civilizations and empires. And Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire points that out. He said, wait a minute, these people became immoral. These people became licentious. These people were in violation of morality, natural law. It's not the only cause, but it is one of five causes for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. We Americans are doing what the Romans did with vigor, as the Kennedys would say, with vigor. Going on here, every person who has a husband or wife marries another is guilty of polygamy and shall be punished. That started in 1878, by the way. 
polygamy, anti-polygamy laws. The United States Supreme Court stated in the case of, of Davis v. Beeson back in 1890 that the U.S. considers bigamy and polygamy as crimes. And the state of Idaho also declared bigamy and polygamy illegal and declared that anyone who commits it, teaches it, or even encourages it is forbidden from voting or holding office in that territory. They got so serious. You know, these people get Christian zeal, you know. They got so serious up there that just teaching it, tolerating it, encouraging it, that they would take the vote away from you and take public office away from you. So a man named Samuel Davis was caught in the crime, fined, and jailed. He argued that he was being imprisoned for his religious belief that he should have the freedom to commit bigamy and polygamy under the First Amendment. The decision of the court was delivered by Justice Stephen Fields, who had been appointed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863. And here's what Fields' opinion was. He said, bigamy and polygamy are crimes by the laws of all civilized and Christian countries. They're crimes by the laws of the United States, and they're crimes by the laws of Idaho. They tend to destroy the purity of the marriage relation, to disturb the peace of families, to degrade women, or women and debase men. To extend exemption from punishment for such crimes would be to shock the moral judgment of the community. To call their advocacy a tenet of religion is to offend the common sense of mankind. There have been sects which denied as a part of their religious tenets that there should be any marriages or marriage tie and advocated promiscuous intercourse of the sexes as prompted by the passions of its members. Should a sect of either of these kinds ever find its way into this country, Swift punishment would follow the carrying into effect of its doctrines, and no heed would be given to the pretense that their supporters could be protected in their exercise by the Constitution of the United States. And probably never before in the history of this country has it been seriously contended that the whole punitive power of government for acts recognized by the general consent of the Christian world must be suspended in order that the tenets of a religious sect may be carried out without hindrance. The constitutions of several states in providing for freedom of religion have declared expressly that such freedom shall not be construed to excuse acts of licentiousness. That was Justice Field back in 1890. Boys and girls, the Seventh Commandment was up and running and in good health as recently as 1900. So in the last 100 years, we've taken on this licentious behavior here in the United States. i got to give you a mid-course reminder here, and we'll take a look at the Eighth Commandment right after this. Now, we often endorse or recommend books, papers, periodicals, newsletters to our listeners. These endorsements and recommendations that we give don't mean that the authors or publications that we're endorsing or recommending will necessarily reciprocate. That's all keep in mind that most of these authors and publications that we cite here on the Law Hour and Editorial Review may be hostile, political, religious, economic, sectarian, racial, or ethnic partisans, and their viewpoints may not be totally endorsed by the Law Hour. Now, these opinions, beliefs, comments, views, and expressions that you hear on this program are mine. They're mine alone. They don't necessarily represent the views, beliefs, or the opinions of the advertisers, the sponsors, the management, or the staff of this radio network or of this local radio station. All right, we're talking about the Ten Commandments in American Law from the book by William J. Federer, The Ten Commandments and Their Influence on American Law. You can get a copy of the book from the uh, website. There's a website here. I think this book came from Artisan Sales. Now, I don't have the name and number of Artisan Sales right here in front of me, but if you looked it up on the web, the Internet, Artisan, A-R-T-I-S-A-N, Artisan Sales, or Artisan Publishers, I think you'll find them over in Oklahoma here in the United States, or in Oklahoma, I believe. Arts and Sales, so it's where you'll find E. Raymond Capt's books also. 
Now, if you don't find it there, then why don't you take a look at their web page. It's called www.amerisearch.net. It's spelled A-M-E-R-I-S-E-A-R-C-H, just like it sounds, Amerisearch. And they have an address. It's Amerisearch Incorporated at Post Office Box 20163, St. Louis, Missouri. And their zip code is 63123. 63123. And they've got a phone there. It's a toll free number. 1 888 USA Word. 1 888 USA Word. W O R D. All right, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Take a look at commandment number eight, the one that deals with theft. Webster's Dictionary, thou shalt not steal. Do you notice that God is is, uh, brief? You know, it's thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. I mean, he gets right to the point. Now, there's two or three commandments that have a couple more words than that. But if you take a look here at the uh, at the number of words in the Ten Commandments, it's under 300. I think it's 289 words. The Ten Commandments, <clears throat> 289 words. Ronald Reagan one time was given a speech, and he said, the Gettysburg Address has, you know, so many words in it. It's four or five hundred words. He said the Ten Commandments have about 289 words. And I think that was where I got that number. But he said, one regulation from the Department of Agriculture concerning the price of cabbage had something like 23,000 words to it. Now, you talk about lawyers today, you know, and lawmakers today. Boy, those guys, they're, they're not short of wording. They've got, they've got words and words and words. In fact, from, from where I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the U.S. Code, more than 100 volumes in the United States Code. And the volumes all have about 500 pages in them. Oh my God, how many <clears throat> pages is that? We had 500 volumes, excuse me, 100 volumes times 500 pages. We would have 50,000 pages. Now, they're adding to that at the rate of 47 pages a day at the federal level. So 47 times, I'm going to put in 365, would be 17,000 pages a year. Can you believe that? 47 pages a day. I imagine it isn't 47 pages, including Sundays and holidays, but uh, probably just about five days a week, working days. In which case, you know, it'd be a few less than that, but... Think of that, 50,000 pages of material, and they're adding at the rate of 17 pages a day. And that's just the federal laws. They don't talk about the state laws, county laws, city ordinances, and then all of the myriad little bureaucracies that are everywhere writing rules and regulations like your city building department, your city building code. Now, this thing of theft is the basis of Anglo-Saxon administration as it, as it applies to private property. Private property. I picked up a book one time, and it said that uh, Moses was a socialist. Got news for that guy. Moses was not a socialist. The exact opposite to socialism. See, communism calls for the abolition of all right to property. That's the first plank. But the Eighth Commandment establishes property and property rights. So if you want to know where property rights come from, they come from the Ten Commandments. And with specificity, they come from the Eighth Commandment. Thou shalt not steal is found in Exodus 20, verse 15, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 19. Noah Webster's original 1828 Dictionary of the English Language gives this definition, steal. S-T-E-A-L, to withdraw or pass privately, to slip along. It's a fixed of mind to fly all company. One might she stole away from whom you now must steal and take no leave. A soft and solemn breathing 
A sound arose like a steam of rich distilled perfume and stole upon the air. Nor number two, to practice theft, to take feloniously. He steals for a livelihood. Thou shalt not steal, Exodus chapter 20. So theft, then, is the taking of somebody's property. That's what it is. It's the taking from somebody, his property without his consent or without his knowledge, or by taking it with his consent by some fraudulent contrivance. Steal, <clears throat> to take and carry away feloniously as the personal goods of another, to constitute stealing or theft, the taking must be felonious, that is, with an intent to take what belongs to another and without his consent. Let him that stole steal no more, we see in Ephesians chapter 4. To withdraw or convey without notice or clandestinely, they would insinuate or could insinuate and steal themselves under the same by submission. To gain or win by address or gradual and imperceivable means, variety of objects has a tendency to steal away the mind from its steady pursuit of any subject and so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Now, Staver puts it this way. He says, The Eighth Commandment states, Thou shalt not steal. This command is too numerous to trace in its brief, or in this brief. James Kent, who together with Justice Joseph Story, was considered as one of the two fathers of American jurisprudence, wrote, to overturn justice by plundering others' tendency to destroy civil society, to violate the law of nature and the institutions of heaven. That's what theft is. It is to overturn justice by plundering others tended to destroy civil society. It is to violate the law of nature and the institutions of heaven. The anti-theft law is an institution of God himself. Now, not only have the laws against theft been derived from the Eighth Commandment, but also laws protecting the integrity of elections, as well as the U.S. Constitution's takings clause. Did you know in our Constitution we have a takings clause? It's against the law for government to come and take your house to build a freeway without your consent and without comp compensation. Now, they can take it, but they got to take it by just compensation. You can't steal it. Now, oftentimes, public officials will, by their actions, take property and then not pay its full value. So how do you get full value of your property or for your property? You have to litigate. You take the government to court, and you say, they're trying to take my house to build a freeway, but they're only giving me half the value of it. And here's what the real value is, and the jury will decide. It'll be a jury of people just like you. You sit there and you tell them, hey, listen, do you think it's right that the government should take my $200,000 house and only pay me $200,000? Don't you think I should get $400,000 for my $200,000 house so that all you people can run up and down on this freeway when it's completed? See, then the jury's going to weigh that and say, well, why should this guy be paid twice what the house is worth? I mean, isn't it satisfactory to pay him the value of the house, and then he can go relocate somewhere else? That's because his house sits right where we want to build this freeway. All right? You know, theft can occur in more than one direction and for more than one person and by more than one means. Now, the influence of the Eighth Commandment is shown in the following references. Let's take a look at James Lowell. James Lowell was an American poet, editor, and diplomat. He was the son of Charles Lowell, minister of the West Church in Boston, a graduate of the Harvard Law School. And James Lowell wrote poetry and prose, which received wide acclaim. His well-known works include Fable for Critics, The Biglow Papers. He edited the Atlantic Monthly, and the North American Review. He received honorary degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge. He became a professor at Harvard. Lowell was appointed by President Rutherford B. Hayes as U.S. Minister to Spain and England, where he was immensely popular. Well, on November the 20th, 1885, 
in his international copyright, James Lowell said this. He said, in vain we call old nations fudge and bend our conscience to our dealing. The Ten Commandments will not budge and stealing will continue stealing. Mark Twain had an observation concerning theft. He said, there was no getting around the stubborn fact that taking sweetmeats was only hooking, while taking bacon and hams and such valuables was plain, simple stealing. And there was a command against that in the Bible. So they inwardly resolved that so long as they remained in the business, their piracy should not again be sullied with the crime of stealing. We Americans are very crafty that way. We like to change the names. And then it makes us all feel better when we commit the crimes. For instance, if I said to you, would you like to go out tonight and commit adultery, you would probably withhold your foot and say, no, no, I don't think we'd better do that. But if I put it this way, I said, hey, how would you like to go out chasing tonight? How would you like to go honky-tonking? Uh, let's go out and drag the main main drag. The, the objective here is to go out and find some woman that we can have sexual relations with. That's the bottom line. But we don't like to use that term. It's too direct. So when we're out stealing, we don't like to call it theft. You know, we like to use, you know, some kind of euphemistic term. I had a guy here one time, he said, well, I boosted it. You, you boosted it. <laughs> that was his term. <clears throat> you didn't steal it. No, no, I, I just boosted it. Well, there's a thousand of those little terms, you know, that you can use to justify your act. But boys and girls, theft is theft is theft is theft, and that's the bottom line. Now, it's not necessarily, when we take a look at, at theft, it's not necessarily a capital crime, although it can be. Let me give you an illustration as to how that works. A, a capital crime is one which, which entails the death penalty, and theft does, in fact, entail the death penalty in one particular form. And that's where the thief is killed at night. No blood shall be, shall be shed for a thief who was killed in the act of his theft at night. But if you kill this guy in the daylight, now that has a different ring to it. In Berkeley, California, some years back, a man went on vacation. So he said to his neighbor, Hey, neighbor, would you watch my property for me? And the neighbor said, Well, certainly. So while he was watching his property, in broad daylight, two kids come out of his neighbor's house carrying some stuff. So the neighbor that's watching the property, he goes into the bedroom, picks up his shotgun, comes out, and confronts these two guys in the driveway. Now, the driveway was a what they call a, a common driveway. There's, I don't, I, you don't see this here in the Midwest, but out in California, or say in San Francisco and Oakland, places like that, where land is pretty valuable around San Francisco Bay, and in short supply and highly priced, two guys will have a uh, will have a common driveway between their houses to go back to their garages, which sit, are situated in the back of their property. So instead of having two driveways, they'll have one common driveway which splits off behind the house and goes into the garage on the left, and the other one goes into the garage on the right. And so they have a common easement there. So, well, these two kids are out here in the common easement, which is which is on this guy's property. That common easement makes it this guy's property. And so he says, halt, halt, and they split and ran. So he shot and killed one of them. Shot and killed one of them. And the, the other one got away. Whether he got caught later or not, I don't know. But the guy that was watching his neighbor's property was then prosecuted for manslaughter. He was convicted, and rightly so. On the last program, I brought this to your attention. 
that when we deal in war, we deal with certain restrictions. They're called the rules of engagement. There's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. For instance, if you're going to kill somebody, you've got to make sure that this guy is in your house. If you kill this guy on your porch, if you kill this guy in the front yard, you're asking for trouble here. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule. The general rule when it comes to killing people is, is that you have to be in fear of your life and be able to demonstrate that you were in fear of your life and that you thought, you believed, this was a belief, that if you didn't act in self-defense, that you were going to be killed or seriously injured. Now, under those circumstances, you can kill in self-defense. Well, theft has a caveat, it has a rule of engagement that goes along with it. And then the rule of engagement is this. If a thief be found breaking up, and it be at night, and he be killed in the process of breaking up, no blood shall be shed for him. But if you kill this guy in the daylight, then he should pay back. The penalty for theft is the payment of the theft with a penalty. Generally speaking, it's two times the amount of the theft. But if the theft were sold and it wasn't recoverable, then the penalty is five times the amount of the theft. And then somebody will say, well, well but what if he stole a loaf of bread because he was hungry? Then the penalty is seven times the amount of the theft. So if you're stealing food, and the common, you know, the common preacher would tell you today, well, he just stole a loaf of bread because his little children were hungry. And he was justified in stealing the loaf of bread so he could feel, feed his little kids. What a crock of BS. You didn't get that out of the Scripture, and you didn't get that from the Creator. You got that from your religion, pulpit parrot. The theft of, of food has a higher penalty than the theft of a diamond ring. You gotta pay back you gotta pay back seven times. Now ordinarily when you're stealing food, it won't amount to as much as the diamond ring. You know, if you're measuring in dollars. But to excuse somebody because he's stealing food for his little kids over here is inexcusable conduct. Anybody that came to me and said, Hey listen, I got hungry kids over here that I need a job or I need some way to feed my kids. Would you give me a job? Would, would you put me to work doing something here so I can get some food to feed those children? I'd hire them in a heartbeat. That's what the law requires. Love your neighbor as yourself. What would you do if you were hungry? Go out and steal your neighbor's cow? Or would you go to your neighbor and say, I don't want to steal your cow, but I'm hungry. Now, I shouldn't eat. No man should eat that doesn't work. So if I work, then may I eat? May I eat at your table? Humble yourself before your master, and he'll feed you because it's a duty. Now, if you shoot this guy in the daylight, then blood shall be shed for him. But if, on the other hand, you kill him at night, and I think I mentioned this to you last time, I'll mention it again. Cuban guy down in Florida, don't know exactly where, He's being burglarized. He goes out in his garage and starts sleeping out in his garage. Sure enough, these burglars come back to rob him again. Now, they break in. This guy's garage is locked. He's sitting in there with a shotgun. He waits until they break in. Now, it's pitch black in here, and as soon as they come in, he starts shooting with his shotgun. He kills one or two of them. Prosecutor prosecuted him. And the jury cut him loose. He said, I was in fear of my life, and he shot him at night in the dark. That's biblically correct. That's what the, that's what the rules of engagement call for. If it's dark, no blood shall be shed for him. Make sure you shoot this guy in the dark. It would help if you were in fear of your life. All right, so the Eighth Commandment then. Thou shalt not steal. Short, direct, and to the point. It's the backbone. It's the fundamental law that protects your right to property. If we did not have, thou shalt not steal, we could not have property rights. Property rights. Property rights are protected and protected by the Eighth Commandment. 
from each according to his ability and to each according to his need is simply a methodology of theft by use of the state and the police power of the state to take from those who are weaker and give to those that are stronger from those that can cannot defend it. That's what that's what the first plank to the communist manifesto calls for. Every one of the ten planks to the Communist Manifesto is a violation of one or more of the Ten Commandments, without exception. The ten planks to the Communist Manifesto are the exact opposite to the Ten Commandments. The ten planks to the Communist Manifesto is the law of Satan the devil, as opposed to or in contradistinction to the Ten Commandments, which are the law of the creator of the universe, the law of God. And so we all have a choice to make. And by God, here in America, we've made our choice, haven't we? We've adopted the Ten Planks to the Communist Manifesto. We've kicked God, the Bible, and prayer out of our public schools and out of our public life. We'd rather pay a 40% income tax than a 10% tithe. You talk about giving God the finger. I mean, we are the creme de la creme. We are the champions of finger given here in the United States of America. Now, the rest of you out there in the world, pay attention and watch America. Watch us Americans as we give our God the finger. Watch as we Americans are taken into national captivity. Watch as we end up eating our children for want of all things. Watch what happens to us now as we violate the Ten Commandments and give God the finger in the process. Pay attention and observe. Learn from our mistakes. Maybe it won't have to happen to you. But it's surely going to happen to us. And come to think of it, I can't think of a nation. I can't think of a group of people who have been more wicked, who have been more evil, and deserve the retribution of our Creator more than the people of the United States of America. If you can think of any out there, send me an email and name them, would you? If we don't take the cake, if we haven't topped Sodom and Gomorrah, if we haven't bested the Roman Empire, if we haven't done more wickedness and evil than the Babylonians, Assyrians, and the Egyptians, let me know, would you? Have you read The Last Prophecy? The book of Revelation. Who can understand it? We believe that God wrote His Word to us for our understanding and salvation, on which so many diverse Christians believe in the same fundamental principles. But not so the prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. Has God, by His Holy Spirit, given a sure interpretation to these mysterious passages through the centuries? Yes, He has. The only difference to the individual is on which side of each prophecy he stands in time, before or after, past or future. The last prophecy is as much a book of history, fulfilling prophecy, exposed in such a way as to leave you without a doubt. Because we are living near the end of this era, we should be able to understand the substantial amount of the revelation which has already come to pass. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's one 800 375-4188. 